a Red Bull drive is the obvious standout choice for Carlos, who is free agent in 2025 after being released by Ferrari to make room for Lewis Hamilton. Especially in light of the uncertainty surrounding Mercedes and its continued struggles with this set of rules. A different question is whether Carlos and a Red Bull would be to take over for Max Verstappen, who has departed, or in the seat next to him, which is presently held by Sergio Perez. These decisions all contain subtleties that are not immediately obvious. This is a challenging topic given the ongoing power struggle at Red Bull. The key to Horner staying in his job was his decision to back down from Verstappen's threat to quit, which he did precisely in Jeddah. Welcome to F1 Opinion. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon for more updates. Horner's complimentary remarks made in Melbourne regarding Carlos's potential attraction to the team meshes quite well with that approach of making a statement to the Verstappens, essentially stating, Carlos driving a Red Bull versus Max driving a Mercedes. How would you imagine that to proceed? However, let's assume that Horner is doing more than merely leveraging Carlos's accessibility as a tool in his struggle for survival. For the sake of argument, let's say that even if Verstappen stayed, the interest would still exist. Since parent company executive Oliver Mintzlaff met individually with Horner and Helmut Marko on Sunday in Jeddah, there has undoubtedly been an uneasy ceasefire at Red Bull, meaning that neither of them is leaving for the time being. Verstappen's motivation for leaving, as well as his potential contractual right to do so, go away now that Marko is on board. Naturally, all of these assumptions are speculative in such a volatile circumstance, but in 2025, might Carlos be a competitive substitute for Sergio Perez at Verstappen's side? The amount of animosity that existed between this partnership as rookies at Toro Rosso from 2015 to early 2016 is one obstacle that is often mentioned in relation to this. Though a lot has changed since then, some aspects are still pertinent. For example, Horner might find something appealing because the Verstappens don't find it as appealing. The dynamics of Toro Rosso during that period were mostly driven by Marco's unwavering desire to bring Max into the Red Bull family and Joss Verstappen's opposition to it. When Max was still racing in 2012, Marco had been pressuring Joss to add him to the Red Bull junior driver roster. Marco was already persuaded that little Max was the next big thing in talent. Joss, on the other hand, was almost pathologically opposed to Max participating in any young driver programs. It removed themselves from control and gave up too much power too soon. Much better, Joss thought, to be on my own. Sure that Max would still make waves with every stride he took. In this manner, as F1 started to take shape, they might be in a far stronger bargaining position. Naturally, Joss was proven to be 100% accurate. Nobody says no to Helmet, remembered team owner Fritz van Amersfoort, who had previously driven Joss and GM Lotus and operated Max in Formula 3. However, Joss did, he resisted them all for as long as he could, but then he told Helmut, now it's time. And that's when he got his Formula One deal. Max Helmut, I believe, would only have waited for anything like this. However, these characters mesh well together. Helmut enjoys adventure and risk, and he thinks it works with Verstappen. After spending so much time trying to convince Marco to sign the Ruthless Joes, Toto Wolf of Mercedes, Ferrari had also shown interest, was able to get Max at 17 years old into Formula One during his second season in karts, heavily based on Joss's words, as though the Verstappen's decision to put him there was a favor to Red Bull. Before Max had even taken a seat at the wheel, the dynamics were clearly in the Verstappen's favor. It was an unusual circumstance. The prospect of Max quitting if he didn't have a position with the senior team by a specific deadline in 2016 was one of the conditions they agreed upon. Despite Horner's misgivings, Marco accepted it, which Joss duly took note of. Joss and his management partner, Raymond Vermeulen, gained unheard of authority within the company as a result of Marco's obsession with Max's level of talent, and they were not afraid to use it. This has persisted to the current day. Carlos arrived at Toro Rosso simultaneously, although his route there had been somewhat dissimilar. He had been a member of the Red Bull Junior Squad for a number of years, and his only means of survival was hard work. He remained on that ladder thanks to titles in Formula Renault 2.0 and Renault 3.5. No unique status existed. The renowned World Rally champion Carlos Sr. was supervising and encouraging his son's career, but only intervening when necessary from the sidelines. However, young Carlos had great talent, perhaps even better than what the Verstappens had expected. He had five seasons of single-seater experience already 
as opposed to Verstappen's one. A solid database, a fierce competitive spirit, and an abundance of skill. The two novices on the track were nearly identical. After accounting for DNFs and other events during their few seasons together, the statistics somewhat favor Verstappen in the races and Carlos in qualifying, but tiny margins on both ends. At their debut race together, the 2015 Australian Grand Prix, a precedent was created. Verstappen missed Q3, but Carlos made it. Joss was not happy with Max's Q2 run timing as he watched from the garage. He was too exposed, it was too late, and there was no margin for error, which is exactly what happened as Verstappen crossed up out of turn four. Joss questioned this and was informed that Max's engineer lacked the power to override the coordinated run plan, which stated that the two cars runs were part of the team's overall operation. Joss approached Marco directly, not even thinking twice about bypassing team principal Franz Tost. The Verstappens did not come here to serve as someone's property. Marco tried his best to make everything peaceful. He personally informed Max's engineering team that he would handle any problems with Tost and that they could act independently in similar circumstances in the future. This arrangement remained unknown to the other members of the team. However, following Melbourne, there was unquestionably a more Max-centric vibe inside the team. Simple things, and they were always provided with equal gear, but Carlos lacked the implicit power that Max possessed. Carlos simply put his head down and kept competing. The perception of his season wasn't quite in line with reality because of a number of significant retirements, and Verstappen was always in the limelight. Max's final race with the team in Sochi 2016 was the last time the run plan problem surfaced. To release him at what they believed to be the most advantageous moment, his engineers disobeyed the run plan. After the weekend, Tost was furious and dismissed two of the engineers. Marco got them employment elsewhere. Max was driving a Red Bull and winning the Spanish Grand Prix by the time of the next race. Verstappen's interests are maximized by Max's management team through Marco, who embodies the strength of his brilliance. Therefore, even in the midst of Red Bull and Max's enormous success together, there remains a ferocious independence there. Being the fastest driver in the fastest car means that he never needs assistance. However, Jaws will be outspoken in his objections should a decision be made that would have been better for him. Granting Sergio Perez pit priority at Monaco 2022, for instance. Marco is then left to mend the team's differences with the racing team, which naturally, he is not always able to do. As observed in 2016 at Toro Rosso, any team will have a point of divergence between the interests of the team and its top driver. However, the Marco Verstappen's relationship at Red Bull really emphasizes it. In a sense, he has joined their cause. That was the cost of bringing Max on board all those years ago when Ferrari and Mercedes had other options. Thus, Joss and Max have very firmly taken sides in the ongoing power battle, which was already in place after Dietrich Mateschitz's death in October 2022, but was made public by Horner's alleged behavior towards an employee. Horner is willing to let go of Max if he is forced to make a decision and he maintains his authority. He would obviously prefer that Max stayed. However, not in any circumstances. Therefore, it makes sense that Horner would be drawn to the idea of hiring Carlos from this angle. Although he couldn't completely replace Verstappen, it would lessen the team's reliance on Max. If Max stays, Carlos's presence would likely guarantee a more competitive teammate than the one he has been facing for the past several years, which is also valuable in the power dynamics. Carlos would put his head down and focus on his performance in the interim, similar to the last instance. What are your thoughts? Let us know in the comment down below and don't forget to like and subscribe for new upcoming videos of Formula One. Thanks for watching.